Good morning, Living Grace Church. This is Rachel Hammond here, and we just want to say thank you so much for participating in the Love Thy Neighbor Challenge these past five weeks. It's been incredible to see how um, the church has truly embodied uh, the hands and feet of Jesus during these few weeks. Um, and we are on our last week. So week six, this next week, is um, clean up your neighborhood. And that can look like a lot of different things. Picking up trash um, at local parks or maybe um, gathering areas like pa walking paths, those kinds of things. Um, or knocking on an elderly neighbor's door and asking if they need any yard help as a family. Um, all those kinds of things. So please don't forget to send pictures. Hashtag Living Grace Living Out Loud. And uh, also, let's just remember that it doesn't stop here. We've started such a great thing and uh, Carrie Grove Food Pantry still needs our help. The vulnerable in our community still need our help and there's still much work yet to do. God bless. Thanks. Good morning, Living Grace. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us here on our Sunday morning online services. And if you're new, we want to say a special welcome to you. We hope you are blessed by this morning's worship. And as you can see, I'm sitting in the tech booth of the church building right now. And that is because I so dearly miss the times when we are able to fill this space in corporate worship. Um, and, I, and I so look forward to the day when we'll be able to do that again. But what I'm asking this morning is that you would join me in a spirit of prayer over the leaders of our church in this time as they have so many big decisions to make and what steps to take and as God leads our church to be able to to move back to be to to do corporate worship again and so uh, we know that in, in Paul's letter to the Philippians uh, chapter 4 verse 7 that it's the peace of God that transcends all of our understanding and guides our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus and that is my prayer for the leaders of living grace that they um, would have a peace over their hearts and minds that only could come from God and that they could they could seek the best um, counsel and discernment um, as a team to make the best decision for our church to be able to move, uh, take steps back to be able to worship together again. So would you join me in prayer in the next couple of days, in the next couple of weeks? Um, and as we prepare our hearts for uh, our musical worship this morning, let's open up our hearts and our minds to what God wa wants to speak to us uh, right now. And so let's worship together. Sing wide, all you 
let your heart be troubled hold your head up i don't fear no evil fix your eyes on this one truth god is madly in love with you so take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes
Well, happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. I uh, hope you've got some fun plans for today. And I hope, of course, part of it is you're worshiping with us this Sunday morning. And, of course, what I really hope is you get to do that barbecue. Well, I hope you also enjoyed the video we just had. Just a little small, tiny way for us to all say thank you, dads, for all that you do. Wish we could do it in person and share that with you. But I uh, hope you'll know that though we're uh, across the internet, that doesn't mean we don't think about you and appreciate you and hope that you have absolutely a fantastic day. And of course, when we share this time together, it is also an opportunity for us to remember our Heavenly Father, who's perfect in all that He does and cares for us so deeply. And we just praise the Lord that uh, we can look to Him as our example uh, for how to be a dad. So I want us to go into prayer and I want to pray for our Father fathers and pray for our families and then let's pray for all of us that as we turn our attention back to the book of Romans that we will uh, hear God's spirit speaking to us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for all of our uh, dads out there for the uh, hard work they do, caring for their families, uh, loving their wives, taking care of their kids, spending time with them, uh, balancing a lot of demands, lots of pressures. And, and we're on top of that, we're all human, and we have feet of clay, and we make mistakes, and yet, Lord, you have placed us in such an important uh, place in our families, and really, as a result, in our society. So we thank you for our dads, and, and we pray for those uh, ones who, on, sadly, do not 
have reason to celebrate their dads because their dads are absent or have not been caring and loving as they should. We just pray that they will look to our Heavenly Father who is perfect and right in all that He does and cares for us as His own. We thank You again for Your Word. It's instructive, it teaches us, it challenges us, and it encourages us. So Lord, help us in these next few moments as we watch into the service today that uh, we'll set aside the distractions and let the Spirit of God speak to each and every one of us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, one day you get a letter or a call that you have been looking forward to. You know, maybe it's a relative uh, that lives far away. Or maybe it's a, a friend you haven't seen in a long, long while. Or maybe it's an old high school classmate way back. Well, we won't talk about how many years ago that might be for you. But the reason why you're uh, really looking forward to hearing from them is uh, you guys have got some things uh, in the works. Maybe with the family member, you're, you're planning an upcom- upcoming family uh, get-together on, on a holiday, and you're going to be talking about what's going to happen and where it's going to be. Or maybe with your old friend that you haven't seen in years, you're going to be planning a trip to go camping out west, go to Wyoming, and uh, having a great time. And so you want to get all those details worked out so you have two families uh, can get together and have a great time. Or maybe that high school classmate that uh, you're looking forward to hearing from. Uh, maybe the two of you are in charge of planning a high school reunion, kind of getting the old classmates back together and catching up, catching up over all the years uh, that have passed. Now, we would expect in that message, whether it's a letter or an email or whatever it might be, that they're going to start off, though, talking a little more personal, maybe a personal greeting, uh, saying, hey, by the way, how are you doing? Just kind of that nice personal touch. But, of course, we would anticipate, ever how they communicated with us, that the, the most of it, the bulk of the communications can be about the topic at hand. You know, maybe it's the holiday family get-together or the camping trip or the high school reunion. And you got all those details you want to work out. And most of it is, is, that's what it is. But you would also anticipate and even maybe look forward to the fact that at the end of that communication, they'd probably kind of catch you up on what's going on. Maybe they'd give you some personal notes about themselves, their families, uh, maybe tell you what the wife and kids are doing, you know, maybe what's going on with them professionally, maybe catch up on talking about some personal notes about, you know, what the kids are often doing, maybe something about what they anticipate coming in the next few years, maybe a move that's getting ready to take place, all kinds of things, just kind of catching up. Now, think about that letter or email or whatever you might get. Uh, Would you get it and the first thing you do is just kind of ignore the first part, ignore the last little part, and just only focus on the, the, the content in the middle, the bulk of stuff? You'd say, well, of course not. I would be just as interested, if maybe not more interested, in what's at the beginning and what's at the end, end because it's kind of that personal side. It, it's the catching up that you look forward to. And in some ways, that's kind of where we are when we are coming to this part in the book of Romans. Now, I realize our time in the book of Romans has only been over the last, uh, you know, chapters 12 through 15, or 16. Uh, and we did not look at the rest of the book. But if you were to look at the book as a whole, uh, don't forget that it's Paul's letter to the Roman Christians. And it begins, like any good letter in chapter 1, in the first 17 verses, with greetings and an introduction, uh, kind of uh, saying, how are you, and uh, grace and peace to you. But then beginning in chapter 1, verse 18, Paul turns to the real meat or the the, the strong content of the book. And it goes all the way into the first part of chapter 15. Now, when Paul starts off, he shares some difficult but very important truths about the human condition. He points out the fact that all of us are sinners. All of us need a Savior. He points out to us that our only hope for our sins to be forgiven, of having eternal life, is through Jesus Christ, that we might be declared righteous in God's sight because of his death and resurrection for us. And that's what we see from chapter 1, verse 18, through the end of chapter 4. 
And the very heart of that, in fact, the very heartbeat of the whole book of Romans is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, when you come to chapters 5 through 8, again, staying in that, the meat of the book, uh, Paul digs deeply into how salvation also means we are to live differently, uh, that our lives are to be lived for Christ. And we are not to live it in our own strength. Instead, we are to live it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then when we come to chapters 9 through 11, Paul touches on some very challenging but also very important uh, theological issues. He talks about divine election and human responsibility, especially as it relates to evangelism and missions. But he also in there talks about the relationship between the, the church, which was composed of Jews and Gentiles, and the people of Israel. And those are very important. But then we come to the part that we've been in for the last number of weeks, and that's Romans 12 through chapter 5, verse 7, 15, excuse me, verse 7, where we've been looking at the nitty-gritty of practical ways that we are to live differently, uh, building on the fact that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. And we are to do that with an understanding that we're also not only to have a, a, a correct ver a vertical relationship with God, but we also have a deep concern for others. And that brings us to where we're going to be today. So if you have your Bibles, turn, if you would, please, to Romans chapter 15 and verse 8. Now, when we come to... Romans 15, verse 8, and really it actually goes all the way through the end of chapter 16, we see a decidedly personal side to the book of Romans, much like you would expect in a personal letter where someone kind of caught you up on what's going on. Now, we're going to look at it both this Sunday and next Sunday because there's a lot of really great stuff here. Because what I want to look at today is, is to look at what it tells us about making the most out of outreach and missions. Now, we do need to remember that when Paul wrote this letter, it was a, a letter written by a missionary to a missions church about their partnership together in the mission of the church, which is reaching out with the gospel to those who don't know him. Now, rather than read the entire section in one reading today, I'm going to actually read most of it, not every verse, but most of it as we go along. But there are a couple of things I just want to make note of before we do that. Uh, the first thing, let's just do remember that the church in Rome, as much of the early church had a challenge, was that it was both Jews and Gentiles. And there were some interesting dynamics. We talked a lot about that when we looked at Romans 14 through chapter 15, verse 7, where there were some disagreements among the believers about some of the disputable matters. And a lot revolved around they came from very different perspectives and very different backgrounds. And so that presented some challenges. And uh, Paul wanted to remind the Jewish uh, believers that they had a responsibility, as God wanted them uh, to have, to be a light to the Gentiles. But he also wanted to remind the Gentiles they had a responsibility to minister to and share with and be partners with the Jewish believers so that they were one in the church. Now, before we get into the things that Paul talked about, there is a verse that I just, I really, really love. And that's chapter 15, verse 14. Because Paul pays these Roman Christians just a fantastic compliment. And it's, what he says about them is something that all of us should wish, if he were writing to us, he would say to us as a church and to us as individuals. So this is something to aspire to. Listen to what he says in chapter 15, verse 14. I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are what? Full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. He's saying to them, I know you to be mature followers of Jesus Christ who not only are mature in their faith, but are sharing their faith. That is a great aspiration for all of us. Now, one of the things I want us to observe, in particular here, because when we talk about outreach, there's a lot of emphasis in this passage 
on what we often think of as missions, cross-cultural ministry. But I want you to observe how Paul spoke of the outreach of missions. Now, when we sometimes talk about missions uh, in, uh, in a, the United States, we almost get this, oh, there's kind of an aura as if missionaries are like special angels from God. They can walk on water. They're just, they're, those guys are unbelievable. Now, listen, I have the deepest respect for those who are serving cross-culturally. They are, fan, they are fantastic followers of Jesus Christ, and we love them and appreciate them. But what I think we should remember, and I think there's lessons to be learned in this, is he doesn't speak to them, about them in almost like romantic terms of like this almost aura around them. What's interesting, he speaks about missions, real matter of fact. Now, I won't read them right now, but in verses 19 through 21, Paul basically gives a summary of what we see in the book of Acts about his three missionary journeys. <coughs> and he basically summarizes at least 10 years of missionary ministry over three known missionary journeys, and he takes, what, three verses to talk about it. Matter of fact, in addition, when you come to verse 24, he speaks very matter-of-factly about some plans he had, because at that time when he wrote the book of Romans, most scholars believe he was in the city of Corinth, which is in present-day Greece, and he talks about a plan to leave from there and go east to Jerusalem uh, to do some ministry. Then they're going to come back all the way past uh, you know, Greece to Rome, which is, of course, in Italy, and from there on to Spain. I mean, what's really incredible about it, that's a very arduous and really probably a dangerous journey of at least 3,000 miles. And yet Paul talks about it with just so matter of fact, there's no oohs, no ahs, like, oh, you're not going to believe what I'm going to be doing. He just shares it. He just tells them. Now, why is that maybe important for us to take note of? Does it mean that missions are not, is not important? Well, not at all. I think what it tells us is that the work of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ was just what the church did. It was not something unusual. It was ordinary. Their expectation was to share the gospel uh, where they were and around the world. Basically, they were simply following what Jesus commanded in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Right before Jesus went back to heaven, he looked at his disciples who he wanted to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came, and he said to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, where they were, that their local town, so to speak, and in all Judea, the, the surrounding area, and Samaria, which was a uh, not far away, what is a very different ethnic group, and he says, to the ends of the earth. All of that was a part of what God's plan was for his church. And certainly, of course, not everyone is to be a missionary, not everyone's to be an evangelist, not everyone's to be a pastor. But outreach was ingrained into the heart and the values and the motivation of the early church. And so it should be in ours as well. I mean, I don't mean this in a bad way, but outreach is not special. It's normal. It's what we should do. It's not something unique. It's not something once in a while. It's absolutely a normal part of carrying out the purposes that God has given to his church. Now, we see that outreach is simply desiring, in a small sense, to be a part of a partnership with Christ and what he is doing. And that's very important. In verses 15 through 19, I want you to know what Paul says here about making the most of outreach and missions. And one of the first things I want us to note is he looked at it as privilege. Now, we know that not just from what we read here, but from all of Paul's writings. Look what he says in verse 15 through the first part of verse 16. I have written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of, the, of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. 
You see, whenever Paul spoke about what he did, he he talked about it in terms of grace. And we know that grace is about God giving to us what we don't deserve. So we automatically think of grace when we think about what it means to come to faith in Jesus. That Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross, rose again on the third day so that hopeless sinners like us might have the hope and the promise of the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. That's because of grace. But that's not the end of grace. Paul talked about here the grace of God when he was given to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. That was an act of God's grace. I mean, there's other places he talked about the grace of giving. We talked about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts were always in the context of the grace of God. Those are all privilege. Outreach is not just a duty and an obligation. It's an incredible privilege because you and I are able to be partners together with the creator of the universe in taking his message to those who haven't heard. Now, also when we are helping uh, or being a part of helping people come to Christ, whether it's here in Cary or around the world, in doing that, it's really an act of worship. Listen to what he says in the last part of verse 16 and verse 17, and you hear the sense of worship that he shares. He says to them, he says, he said, well, let me read all of verse 16. He said, but the, the grace of God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. It's an act of worship. It goes right back to how we began this series. What did it say in Romans 12:1? Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Again, we are blessed when we worship in music. It is a wonderful part of worship, but that is not all of what worship is about. Worship is the everyday experience of the believer giving their lives as a gift of God, a living sacrifice. And part of the sacrifice of thanks for his salvation for us is to give back to him the lives of those who don't know Jesus by pointing them to Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, throughout this book, and especially uh, when Paul addressed the Jewish Christians, he did show them that outreach stretches us uh, as, as be, to be part of something that inevitably is going to push us outside of our comfort zones. Now, let's not forget that when the church began on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, who composed the church at that time? It was entirely Jewish. It was in Jerusalem. It was in what's present-day Israel. That's where it began. And when we read in the book of Acts, we, we become very aware that one of the challenges that those early Jewish Christians had was to reach out beyond themselves to the non-Jews. In fact, initially they stayed just sharing the good news of Jesus with other Jews. But God even used persecution to push them out of that area. So they began to spread. And you remember in the church in Antioch, where Paul and Barnabas were later called to be the first missionaries, uh, that was a church where they began to share Jesus with the Gentiles. And that led to the first mission trip where Paul and Barnabas and their team went to the Gentiles. It was a stretch for them. And so Paul reminds the Jewish believers, when he, we're, we're here in Romans 15, uh, about how very important it is for them to continue to have a concern for the Gentiles. Now, in verses uh, 8 through 12... He, he really drives this point home in a very powerful way because what Paul does, he quotes from the Old Testament several times and from all three major sections of the Old Testament. And he talks about God's love. He uses the word Gentiles, where we see that in our English translation. 
But the actual word is ethnos. We get ethnicity from the nations. I want you to listen to it beginning in verse 8. He said, For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so that the Gentiles, the ethnos, may glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Here he quotes from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22 and Psalm 18. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. And again it says, and this is from the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Again it says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, from Deuteronomy 32. And again, and he goes to the Psalms, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. Again, Isaiah says, now speaking from the section of the prophets, the root of Jesse, talking about Jesus, will spring up one who will arise to rule over the nations, and the Gentiles, the ethnos, will hope in him. That's really important for us to hear. Because when we are doing outreach, whether it be right where we live or around the world, God is challenging us to get outside of our comfort zone. I will tell you this. It is a little inconsistent for us as followers of Jesus Christ to be more concerned about a Hispanic person in Latin America than we are about a Hispanic person who lives across the street. It is inconsistent for us to care about black people in the continent of Africa and not give any concern to the black man and his family who lives down the street. And we often say, oh, God, take the gospel to the Hindus. Take the gospel to the Muslims. Take the gospel to the Buddhist. Listen, they live on your block. They live in your town. They live in your neighborhood. They're here now. You don't have to go to Saudi Arabia to reach out to a Muslim. You can reach out to them right where you live. And if we're to be concerned about outreach, we need to do it right in our back door because we are to be as witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and I think Samaria is where we get into the different ethnic groups. Now Paul also tells us that anything that you and I do accomplish, anything that our missionaries out on the in a cross-cultural setting accomplish is really all about what God is doing through us. The incredible part is that God has chosen to do his work through us and only through us. Look at verse 18 through the first part. Uh, well, verse 18. He said, I will not venture to speak of any sin, anything except that what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. Now, I don't want to sound melodramatic, but God only has one plan for taking the gospel to Kerry and to Chicago and Cairo and China and wherever you want to think. And you know who, how that is? It's through us. Listen, God is not going to go out tomorrow and write the message of the gospel in fiery letters in the sky by where the clouds are. That's not how he does it. He has one plan and one plan only, and it's to you and I to reach out. Again, I'm going to press the case with with us as we are, in a sense, isolated by the coronavirus, that does not even begin to relieve us of our responsibility to reach out. Maybe it's a good thing because maybe it pushes us out of the comfort of sitting in a chair in the church building to realize we have a responsibility to do outreach into our community. That's something we have to intentionally work to do. But we are a part of God's plan. And one of the incredible things is we are his tools to accomplish his purposes. And it is his work, not ours. Think of it this way. Let's imagine you are building something at your house. Maybe you're building uh, a sunroom or building uh, uh, something on your patio or whatever it might be. Doing a project in your, inside your house. You know, to do that, what have you got to have? What do you have to have? You have to have tools, right? You've got to have a saw. You've got to have a hammer. You've got to have drills. 
and other things to get the job done. But when it's all done, when the addition is added on, when, the, when that project is done and people, you know, you show them and said, well, look what we did. Nobody is going to say, wow, do you have an incredible hammer. Your saw is absolutely fantastic. That drill, oh, whoa. No one at all ever gives credit to the hammer or the saw or the drill. Who do they, what do they say? Wow, you did a great job. You really did an awesome job doing that. You know, that's what we're to be about. We're God's tools. He gets the glory. He gets the credit. But guess what? He couldn't do it without us. Okay? I don't care the greatest builder in the world is never going to build that addition when he doesn't have a hammer and he doesn't have a saw and he doesn't have a drill. And God has chosen to use us. Now, that, folks, that's privilege. And I hope you understand that. Now, I only want to take a moment <clears throat> to touch on what is actually kind of a complicated few verses. But in the middle of verse 19 through verse 21, Paul shared his own personal passion as a missionary. And this is more of a focus really on missions. Now, one of the things I want to make just kind of a general observation, and we have to note this when we are reading the Scriptures, there are many times in the Bible we see God describe something to us. He's telling us what happened. But that's different than something that's prescriptive which is a, something that he tells us that we must do. So what Paul did is interesting, it's helpful, but it's not a prescription and a plan that everybody else has to follow. Listen to what he wrote, beginning in verse 19, in the middle of verse 19. He said, so from Jerusalem, where he, be, he began, all the way around to Illyricum, which is on the Adriatic seaside uh, across from Italy, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. He had a huge ministry. It has always been my ambition or my passion to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Now, that's, that's not an ego trip. That's about Paul saying, I want to go where nobody else has gone because they need it. And he confirms that uh, in verse 21 where he quotes from Isaiah 52. He says, rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see. And those who have not heard will understand. That's where Paul's passion was. Now, when we think about missions, by the way, and I think this is important, we sometimes think, oh, missionaries. They're people who go live in another country, and uh, they start a church. Oh, and absolutely, there are a number of missionaries. That's exactly what they do. They go to another place. They go to where they maybe speak a different language. Not always, but may, uh, many times. They have a different culture. Uh, sometimes a different religion, and they try to start churches. That's our, our primary goal, to do evangelism, to help people go from uh, being lost to being saved, go from darkness to light. But there are all kinds of passions that people have, and Paul's passion was to go do pioneer work where nobody else had been. But there's other things that God might call some of you to do. Uh, you may not be what, like a Paul, but uh, have you ever considered perhaps that God might because he's given you a passion for kids and youth, that maybe God might use you in that way. I remember a, a man I knew from a number of years ago when I was church in Elmhurst. He had a ministry with a, a Josiah Ventures in Estonia working with youth. You can go to the mission field and be involved in education, whether from small children all the way through training pastors to, to be pastors. You can go out and serve in medical missions. You can go out and be involved in administrative and support Areas which are very, very important and often underestimated. I think about how many missionaries, the only way they make it is because somebody is able to take them on an airplane and land them uh, in the place where they serve. Some have a great uh, skills and abilities that help them to do relief work. Others have wonderful skills with languages, and they, they, under, they learn Greek and Hebrew, so they can take the Greek and Hebrew of the Old Testament and New Testament and translate the Bible into the language of, heart language of people. All of those are different things, but they all have the same passion that those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. And thinking of worldwide missions, not everybody, of course, is supposed to be a cross-cultural missionary, but every single one of us in, his church, in the church can be and should be in a partnership with them. Well, how do we do that? We are to assist them on their way. <clears throat> Paul talks about that. 
in verse 23 and 24, he says this, but now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions where he had been on his first three missionary journeys, and since I have a longing, I've had a longing for many years to see you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed my, your company for a while. In verses 28 and 29, he says this to them. He says, so after I have completed this task, I'm not going, taking gifts from the Gentiles to help the poor Jews in, back in, in Jerusalem. After I've completed this task and have made sure that they have, been, they have received this fruit, I will go to Spain it visits you in the way, and I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. You know, part of that is certainly, obviously, financial. I, I know that when we talk about giving to missions, people say, oh, that sounds so businesslike. But you know what? It is a real practical way we assist them to do the work of outreach in another culture. And uh, but I want you to think of it also in a, in a little different way. It's not just saying, okay, missionaries, let's send them money. It's really an investment. And it's, it's, an, it's an opportunity for Living Grace Community Church to enlarge our impact around the world by being a part of supporting missions and missionaries. And in doing that, the, the, the ministry of this church can literally touch the, the planet. Just last year, this church supported... 22 missionaries and seven mission organizations in 14 countries on four continents to, and, and provided them a little over $900,000, or 90, excuse me, $90,000. And, and that's just in 2019. Over the last years, hundreds of thousands of dollars have been given to assist them around the world. And we are privileged to do that. Now, <clears throat> by the way, another way we can assist them, sounds really pretty obvious, is what can we do? Help send out more new missionaries. Sometimes missionaries complete their ministry and they need somebody to take their place. We can do that. Help them to get that new missionary out on the field. We can assist them by caring for them. I, I really appreciate what Paul said at the end of verse 24. He says uh, to them, he says, I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. And then in verse 32, he said this to him. He said, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. And one of the ways we can assist our missionaries is just to love on them and care for them and minister to them as they serve the Lord. Now, lastly, we are to uphold outreach wherever it might be, whether it's internationally in cross-cultural missions or even just right in our own community by upholding it in prayer. Look what he says in verses 30 and 31. Paul says, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there. He said, please pray for me. It reminds me of what he said in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. He said to those Christians, he said, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Never underestimate the importance of praying for outreach here and around the world. Pray, pray, pray. That's something that's clearly taught to us, again, throughout the New Testament. And let's keep praying for the life-changing outreach of the gospel to impact as Christ commanded us in Acts chapter 1 in Jerusalem, I'll call it in Cary, in Chicago, to the ethnic groups of our country and to the ends of the earth. And our prayer for Living Grace Community Church is that we would be a gospel-focused, outreach-driven, world Christian group of people. 
and that we will be passionate to be a part of making a difference in the lives of people here and around the world. That is something we should desire to be. As we close this morning, right before I pray, I want to cl- read one verse that I skipped over a while ago. It's Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It's really a great benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Living Grace Community Church. We thank you for what you have accomplished through this church family. But Lord, I believe you have greater things yet for this church. I pray that you would open up doors of opportunity for us to take the good news of Jesus to our community and we'll seize them. I pray that we'll be excited about being a part of what you're doing out from this little place where you've placed it all around the world. I pray that for us, outreach and and missions will not be something special. I pray that it will truly be something normal because it's just what you've called us to do and called us to be. We thank you so much that every single one of us that knows Jesus Christ as Savior came to faith because someone reached out to others and led them to Christ. And that's why we know Jesus today. I pray that we will remember that we ourselves are product of mission work around the world. And I pray that we might turn around and be your instruments for the generations to come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.